everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's webinar, Behind the Butler's Pantry, Olana and the Lives of Irish Servants in the Hudson Valley. My name is Carolyn Keough, and I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs at the Olana Partnership. I'm so excited to welcome my own colleague with New York State Parks, Daniel, and our new collaborator um, in the Capital Region, Elizabeth, for our conversation tonight. Daniel w. w. Bigler has a BA from SUNY New Paltz in Art History and an MA from U Albany in U.S. History. He has been with Olana State Historic Site since 2002 as a historic interpreter and then since 2017 as historic site assistant. He also taught Western Civilization and U.S. History at SUNY Ulster from 2015 to 2020 and was a guest educator for the Hudson River to Niagara Falls exhibit at the Samuel Dorsky Museum of Art in 2009. Elizabeth Stack is the Executive Director of the Irish American Heritage Museum in Albany. Dr. Stack is responsible for operating the museum located at 21 Quackenbush Square, which hosts a number of historical exhibits, as well as lectures, music evenings, and film presentations. The museum is the only national museum dedicated to preserving the history and culture of the Irish in America. Elizabeth joined the museum from Fordham University, where she taught Irish and Irish American history and was an associate director of the Institute of Irish Studies. She completed her PhD at Fordham, writing about Irish and German immigrants in New York at the turn of the 20th century. She has a master's degree in Anglo-Irish relations in the 20th century from the University of College Dublin in Ireland and was a high school teacher in Ireland and the United Arab Emirates before moving to America in 2009. A native of Listowel in County Kerry, Elizabeth sees a huge connection between her own experience as an immigrant and the important mission of her museum to preserve and share Irish heritage and culture. Thank you both so much for joining us. I'm really excited to dive right in. So I know that we talked a little bit about bringing on some images to kind of ground our conversation. So I'm just gonna pull that up right now. <laughs> so in this uh, first image, um, you're looking from the kitchen door uh, through the butler's pantry to the church family dining room here at Olana. Um, the church is usually employed, uh, depending on, of course, the time of year and the needs of a particular season, usually an average of about seven serving staff members at any given time, sometimes as many as 10 or 12. Um, and uh, this is indeed the view you would be seeing if you were one member of that serving staff bringing food from the, uh, the kitchen to the as it was called on the floor plan of the house dining room picture gallery, mm. in the grandiose dining room that the church designed to not only be a dining space, but also to hang his impressive collection of European artwork. Um, the butler's pantry, of course, a very different side of the house, um, not a side that would have been seen by visitors, um, but really strictly for the use of the house staff. And you can see, uh, a little bit to the left of the screen, um, the sink basin itself is kind of cut off on this image, but you can at least see the uh, sort of counter surround of the uh, copper sink that would have been used to wash the uh, mostly relatively expensive china pieces. Um, those pieces in turn stored in the cabinets, of course, lining the uh, right hand side of the um, of the uh, butler's pantry uh, and to answer the question that I see uh, popping up from Kathy Kay there um, <laughs> the uh, door for sort of dramatic effect in this photo the door at the end of the butler's pantry is left open but there was actually a swinging door at the end of the hall so that would have screened it off from view and uh, also because it is a swinging door made it relatively easy for uh, servers that were carrying dishes to or from mm -hmm. the table to uh, kind of shoulder it open and indeed uh, I kind of wish we had an image of it, but if you come to Olana, um, you can see that that door indeed does have um, essentially a hole worn through the stencil work on the door mm. um, from servers shouldering it open for uh, oh, that's fascinating. two generations. Yeah, uh, Dan Daniel, thank you so much. I mean, I think that this is such a great way to start our conversation with this image because it's one that I know many people who are familiar with Olana or who have seen it from afar or seen images, they may not think of this behind the scenes sort of shot. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Olana is the uh, creation and the home and masterwork of the 19th century artist Frederick Church. So, you know, we're going to be kind of going behind the scenes right now and talking a little bit about um, the domestic staff that made, made everything run and operational. So with that, I'll, I'll turn things over to the next slide. This is um, 
the first of uh, a few examples we have of some of the uh, stereotyping that was faced by um, specifically Irish servants in really the entirety of the 19th century, um, whereas many of these servants began coming to the United States during the years of the uh, Great Famine in the 1840s. Um, this particular image, which is actually from my own collection of stereo cards, um, this is uh, from as late as 1899, the, the sort of stereotyping still going on, right, on the, the cusp of the uh, 20th century. Um, and I imagine probably there are examples from even later in the 20th century for that matter. Um, and uh, I guess this would be a good time to turn over to Elizabeth to discuss some of the uh, yeah, if we can just go back very briefly session. to that other one. Thanks, sure. Dan. Um, that, uh, you know, I, I will share the cartoons in a minute. And I was just saying, you know, a while ago, this one actually bothers me more than the, the cartoons do. And I think it's because, so th these existed from about the 1880s right through 1910. And there were basically two varieties. One was Biddy serving potatoes undressed or tomatoes, tomatoes undressed. And it's, it, it's highlighting like her ignorance. She didn't realize that dressing the potatoes meant, you know, putting mm -hmm. parsley or something on them or, you know, so she's taking off her own clothes. And in some of them, they give her a little line of dialogue and, and she says, I'm not taking off another stitch, even if I lose my position. And so, you know, she's trying to retain her, you know, modesty. But I, I just think this is so sort of nasty, you know, on, on a different level from a cartoon, I guess, because it's real people. You know, the one guy is laughing hilariously at her. Obviously, this would be an outrage at a dinner party to see somebody come in in their underwear, you know. And so um, it just shows you, you know, the level of 50 years after these women have been coming in, you know, that they're still being labeled as so ignorant of their own duties, like that they don't know what it means to dress a potato or a tomato. Mm. And so um, if we, you know, go on to the next one. So, and these are from the same year, you know, 1883, um, the, the Irish Declaration of Independence that we are all familiar with, you know, so showing Biddy or, or Bridget, you know, really laying down the law. Uh, again, you know, describing the fact that she can't use the, the tools of her own trade. So the thing in the oven is burning, the pot is over boiling and her poor little wasp mistress, you know, is pleading with her to be reasonable, you know, but Biddy, you can see like she has simian features, you know, her, her dress is not the right length, her earrings are a bit, she's grotesque, you know, and so um, th there's a, there's an element of, you know, savagery about mm. Bridget. Um, uh, Margaret Lynch Brennan has pointed out that her dress has orange shamrocks on the pattern of that dress, which is, you know, another interesting little dig kind of maybe at Irish nationalism. Hmm. And then the next one, of uh, course, uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, just to, to jump in briefly there, I, I don't believe uh, that previous image was one of his, but um, uh, quite a number of uh, really vicious um, anti-Irish cartoons were drawn by one of the major political cartoonists of the time, Thomas Nast, Nast who uh, yeah. often drew yeah. Irish figures with, uh, again, like you mentioned, Monkey. kind of simian features yeah. and showing them as violent mm -hmm. and ignorant. And of course, this is the same cartoonist that's often credited with the uh, popular image of Santa Claus that we know mm -hmm. today. Um, mm -hmm. the, and the Republican, uh, the Democrat symbols. The, yeah, mm -hmm. the Republican mm -hmm. uh, elephant, the Democratic mm -hmm. donkey, the uh, mm -hmm. symbols we still very mm -hmm. much use nowadays. Yeah, nasty was nasty. Uh, this next cartoon, same thing, you know, Bridget has again that kind of simian featured face. Um, and of course, it's hitting at the Catholic identity. So, and you know, these cartoons are very often written in, in the dialect. So, you know, you can hear my accent. She says, so the mistress says, Bridget, take the children to school. What? To the Protestant publics? <laughs> so, you know, it's written incorrectly. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't risk my soul, ma'am, with the likes, you know. And so she won't even bring them to school, you know, because she might be contaminated. And of course, on the other side, you know, particularly Thomas Nast, you know, drew ones of Catholic bishops as crocodiles coming mm -hmm. in, you know, to eat uh, the, the souls of public school children because they didn't want the Protestant Bible read in a public school. Um, so you can, yeah, this one, you know, a little bit funny, Life magazine, you know, in 1896, uh, Bridget has broken so many dishes that the mistress says we'll just have to, you know, I, I don't know what we can do because your wages amount to as much things as you've broken. And she says, oh, I don't know, mum, unless you raise me wages. <laughs> so there's a kind of a canny cleverness to her too, like a little bit of a sly, you know, oh, you could pay me more and then maybe the breakages would stop, you know. Um, 
So, and then this one, again, contrasting, it's Opper, who, who did the first one as well, um, are self-made cooks from paupers to potentiates. So again, she's ordering out the very regal and, and feminine, you know, um, wasp mistress. She's feeding an Irish cop in the corner, you know, and, um, to, and she's overdressed. She's gaudy. You know, the waist is too cinched. The hair is ridiculous, you know. Um, but at home, then look at them, you know, waiting to be evicted. But in America, they do the evicting, you know. Mm. So um, very nasty, you know, kind of connotations there. And yet, you know, here are the real ones. And so we know from various sources, you know, diaries of mistresses and, and even newspaper letters, you know, to editors and things, maids on their day off dressed very well. In fact, there was one mistress, you know, who met her maid on the street wearing the same hat and she almost died, you know, because um, <laughs> it just was not, you know, kosher sort of thing to be wearing the same fashion as her maid. And so, you know, of course they were pretty tidy. And then this, I think, sums up the entire importance of their role. Um, mm -hmm. the remittances home. So these Irish girls, maybe more than Irish male workers who would have earned a pittance, you know, working as a kind of laborers and, and that kind of thing, had to pay rent, of course, most of the men. Women did not pay rent because they worked as maids. 54% of maids, of Irish born women living in America by 1900 worked as maids. Wow. And so they were able to save, you know, their money and send it home. Uh, or donate to the Catholic Church and have schools and churches and hospitals built. So, um, you know, those people are at home reading it. And now we're into Olana. <laughs> a nice uh, bookend there with the kind of beginning and ending with two mm. very different stereoscopic yeah, images. images too um, mm -hmm. from within, I think, three years of uh, one another. That, that last one, I think I saw the date was 1902, if I read it correctly on my screen. Um, yeah. So only a few years after the... Uh, very different viewpoint shown by the uh, the first one we started with. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, a much more sympathetic um, view, mm -hmm. for yeah, sure. Absolutely, yeah. And so I know we're going to talk a little bit about this. Oh, I think my um, PowerPoint's being doing its own timing. <laughs> um, but I know we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the context of our conversation. But you know. Olana's relevance. So I'd love, I know, um, Elizabeth, you had your genealogist look into the McKenna's and I know, Dan, you've done quite a bit of research on your in your own right uh, into this specific family. So I'd love to kind of dive into that and talk a little bit about this, this specific um, family that was living and working at the site. Mm -hmm. Do you want to start, Dan? Yeah. Um, sure. Um... Michael McKenna was the uh, the first of three McKenna siblings that worked at Olana for a matter of decades. He uh, started as a farmhand in the late 1860s. Um, within, I believe, about five years, so fairly quickly after starting, he was listed as the church's coachman, and uh, mm -hmm. he remained in that position until he retired in uh, 1908, I believe, um, was the actual retirement date that we found on some of these uh, clippings, um, which was eight years after Frederick Church's own passing, so he mm -hmm. was actually still here working for Church's son and daughter-in-law um, mm -hmm. for over half a decade following the passing of the, uh, the first generation at Alana. Mm -hmm. Um, his sister, Jane McKenna, came uh, to the U.S. Um, a few years after Michael uh, started working here, and she was hired as the church's cook. Um, she also remained in that position until after the church's lifetime, and uh, he did not work here as long, but uh, a third sibling, William McKenna, um, who I believe previously had worked as a coachman for a family across the river in Catskill, uh, he was hired in, uh, I believe, the 1880s as um, a valet for Mr. Church. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you that know uh, some of Frederick Church's biography, you, you may recall that he became heavily arthritic in his later years, and uh, that would ultimately curtail his painting career, but it did also eventually give him trouble with just daily tasks like dressing mm -hmm. and shaving. So in the 1880s, he started hiring someone in a valet position, and mm -hmm. William McKenna was hired primarily to fill that role. Um, although unfortunately, um, he uh, actually passed away on the Olana property uh, mm -hmm. doing a very different task. Um, mm -hmm. Like staff members today, oftentimes we uh, do things outside of our uh, job descriptions. And uh, William McKenna was helping to cut ice on the uh, lake down at the uh, bottom of the hill. But for those of you that have been here, uh, you drive past on your way into the site. Um, 
we don't know the exact cause, but presumably a heart attack or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, but uh, Michael and Jane, the uh, other two siblings, remained really kind of core members of the uh, the church staff for uh, again not just years, but a matter of decades, um, mm -hmm. some forty five years in the case of uh, Michael. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm going to hold this up. I should have brought it in. You know, you won't really be able to see, but what I want, you won't be able to see it. What's interesting about these, and we can share these later on, it's from the um, the census figures and the the name spelling changes because, of, and I do actually think this is accent, you know, so mm -hmm. um, our genealogist, Lisa walsh Doherty, who's here on the last Wednesday of every month, and you're, you know, welcome to <laughs> contact for an appointment. She does amazing work. Um, she, they, in a later census in 1930, they asked, you know, where was the, the country of origin? And I, I believe it was a child of their, of Michael's that answered, my father was from Northern Ireland. Mm. And so on that first census that, uh, or the second census, sorry, that Jane is, it's the second census that there's a McKenna. It's the first one that Jane appears on. Her name is recorded as McKenna. And that's <laughs> like the Northern Irish, that kind of Scottish, you know, accent. So, She's, it's M C C A N N A. Yeah, but it's clearly McKenna, recall, you know. Yeah. If I recall correctly, I, I went through when I was researching my paper that uh, mm. was eleven years ago now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, as I recall, one of the sense, one of the early censuses uh, also had the spelling. Uh, I think it was McKenny. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a N N Y uh, that the census taker recorded. Yeah, where some of the census takers didn't have great handwriting either. So sometimes and that's it, it's the handwriting that can also too, yeah. affect mm -hmm. how you interpret Absolutely. the spellings, I suppose. And you know, spelling wasn't, um, particularly of names, was never really, yeah. you know, kind of formalized or standardized. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Ellen is the wife. So, you know, we were saying about this in particular with servants and immigrants, you know, it's amazing that uh, that one family of siblings were, were employed at the same place. And again, you know, Margaret and Brendan probably would know more about this um, you know, she wrote kind of the definitive book about uh, maids, but it's, I would say it is unusual, you know, I mean, I'd hate to <laughs> go out on a limb, but it, it would strike me as being unusual that you would be employed in the same household, definitely maybe the same, you know, town, um, but the unusual thing about Irish maids, Irish girls, is they came unaccompanied, you know, most of the time, and so Mm -hmm. In some years, they outnumbered men. Sometimes they were as young as 13. And so, you know, Irish men and Irish women immigrated as single people, not in a family group or Italian men, you know, came on their own and went back and forth. Girls came in equal to or greater than numbers of Irish men, you know. And so in this particular instance, maybe they were able to say, like, you know, I, I'll bring my sister over or, oh, if you need a maid, you know, come. Mm -hmm. So obviously Michael McKenna, you know, got on very well. And as you said, he, you know, he's just listed as a laborer uh, mm -hmm. when he's 25 years of age, you know, in, in that first 1870 census. And then, you know, they trust him enough maybe to bring a brother and a sister and his wife is occasionally hired. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, that, I, that must be unusual. Uh, you know, we talked before, um, maids had definitely like informal networks of communication so they'd be able to say you know i'm leaving because i'm getting married so my person will need a job or you know will need a maid or don't work for that house they don't pay very well you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. so they they did share information but i i think it would seem to me to be unusual to have family you know with you in the house mm -hmm. and i yeah. i just think it's so beautiful you know when we looked at that butler's pantry and you know, when you were designed to be invisible within the house, really, you know, to be like as not bringing attention to yourself and mm -hmm. particularly maybe an artist might be creative and a bit, you know, hot to <laughs> if you disturbed him <laughs> or something, you know. And so it must have been lovely to be able to go to your room at night or I think Michael lived in a house on the property, you know, to be able to go and have those private family mm -hmm. moments yeah. or Christmases together, mm -hmm. you know, when there was so little repatriation to Ireland, you know, that I, I think their story must have been one of the happier stories, mm -hmm. really, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think we talked a little bit about that. And a question I have for you, for Dan and, and you as well, is thinking about, you know, how it, how is the specific lives of this family, the McKenna's, who have this kind of long history at Olana, emblematic of the lives of um, Irish domestic servants and workers that are coming to this country? And how is it quite different? You know, you've pointed out that the fact that they were together is, is very kind of atypical, but where else can we see something that kind of speaks to the larger trend or something that was very specific to Olana? I'm curious. Yeah, and, and possibly even specific to that family. Um, mm. 
the Michael and Dane and to a lesser degree, William um, were here for years on end. William, again, unfortunately passed away, but um, Michael and Dane were both here 40 plus years. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, most of the other servants that appear on the census records that we have only appear on one particular census year's record. And yeah. from uh, mm -hmm. canceled checks and letters and things like that, there did seem to be, as was common at the time in the area, a fairly high turnover rate for staff members, um, probably in part due to the uh, location um, without your own means of transportation. Mm -hmm. It's an isolated location. and um that mm -hmm. probably did play into the churches we, we know also that was an issue with the uh, high turnover rate for the uh house staff at Linden Lindenwall um mm -hmm. Martin Van Buren's home in Kinderhook and mm -hmm. elsewhere in the Hudson Valley um there's mm -hmm. actually uh, there seemed to be a phrase that developed in the Hudson Valley of the quote-unquote servants problem of being able to find uh first be able to find good help and then be able to keep them for yeah. any length mm -hmm. of time and yeah isolated mm -hmm. locations where I'm like, if you're working in the city where you have things to do in walking distance and you're mm -hmm. off hours mm -hmm. up here, you're kind of stuck at work 24 mm -hmm. seven, even when you're off the clock. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, and no place to socialize, yeah. maybe no Catholic church nearby, which wasn't right. always important to them in terms of mass, but the socializing that went on in a parish, mm -hmm. you know, they, they would miss out kind of on that. Um, you know, there was an older Ellen McKen, she's listed in the census in 1870. And so our genealogist was, was wondering, she was 50, you know, when Michael was 25. And mm. she was wondering if that was maybe an aunt or maybe even their mother, you know, in, in one way that had come over. So yeah, that, that might have been the colonel, you know, to bring over the younger yeah. generation. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting to look more into. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't think we've, I, I don't recall seeing any specific indication of that yeah. in letters or anything like that. But, That's uh, fascinating. Yeah, it would be yeah. interesting to look more into, or if it's just a coincidence. And you know, the fact that Jane doesn't marry in one way, like is, I won't say typical, but you get that a lot with Irish servants, which is unfortunate, you know, in the, the um, there was a in immigrant aid sort of society and well, there were fraternal organizations that did immigrant aid, the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick, and they had offices down in the city and in their, um, article uh, in their archives there was a handwritten note about an older woman from Roscommon Catherine something was her name and she was you know now infirm she'd worked for a family for decades you know and they really kind of didn't need her anymore and she wasn't capable of lifting you know the pails of water and the coal and all of this and you know there, there's no pension scheme when you're a maid you know and so they basically were kind of giving her back you know to this Irish age society who decided in their wisdom to repatriate her to Roscommon at 60 something years of age, you know, and you have to think like who was left in her village like that she would know. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it would just show, you know, the, the lack of the safety net for these women if you didn't marry. Mm -hmm. Like most of them worked as a maid, you know, this 54%, and then they got married and then they did not work. They might take in borders, maybe take in a bit of laundry, even though that was quite difficult work, you know. Um, they often took in boarders. That was kind of an easier way of, of doing, of earning money, you know, and what was one more kind of mouth to feed, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was very interesting to me, like that, that Jane was lucky, you know, that she stayed in this household for so long and that she had yeah. siblings and then nieces and nephews, you know, kind of to look after her in her, in her older age. But, mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was a kind of a frightening prospect, I suppose, if you were a single woman in one of these isolated little towns, you know, without a Catholic church or, the ensuing, mm -hmm. you know, other people that went with it, like, and we know Irish girls in the mid, you know, 19th century, particularly down in the city, if you know, in one particular parish in the Lower East Side, 6% of the marriages were between Irish women and Chinese men, because, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act, and even before that kind of prevented Chinese women from coming in. Chinese men often owned their own business, whether it was a laundry or a tea importing. So it was actually kind of an upwardly mobile step for an Irish woman. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes the Chinese men converted to Catholicism and anglicized his name. You know, so you would do better with a guy who owned a, a tea store, you know, than somebody who was digging the railroads, you know. Um, yes, and they yeah. often intermarried Irish Americans and or African Americans. So now that was a little bit more frowned upon, you know, particularly later mm -hmm. uh, during the Civil War and stuff. And it, I, I'm not saying it was huge numbers, you know, but it, it definitely happened where the opportunity was. So it's not like Irish women only wanted to marry Irish men. 
but you know there may not have been an opportunity for anyone <laughs> to meet anyone you know in a smaller upstate town yeah so I'd say a lot actually, of them stayed single yeah some questions have come through about Hudson specifically and so one I just want to make note of is that the Catholic Church in Hudson our president um, of the Alana partnership Sean Sawyer mentioned that it's one of the most magnificent in Hudson so we're he's wondering if that's something um, that makes Hudson particularly welcoming for the Irish. Similarly, Nancy had a question, which is how did Irish girls and men get to Hudson? You know, yeah. what was the kind of um, transport, the map, the, the path that, that folks would take? Mm -hmm. And then also why would immigrants be drawn to the upper Hudson when the salaries and jobs might've been a little bit more lucrative downriver, if that is potentially the case? Any thoughts on, on that specifically? Well, I suppose two and three might be um, answered by sometimes, and particularly in the 1840s and 50s during the Great Hunger, they, it was more expensive to come into New York Harbor, particularly during the Great Hunger, because the illness on board the ships, you know, and the numbers coming in, they actually put a head tax on passengers. So mm. a lot of people would have come in through Canada and, and walked down or, or made their way down, you know. So the Hudson, you know, I don't know, would you get tired <laughs> going all the way down to the city? Or, and, and definitely, like, there was this informal network. So, you know, I've talked to many people here in Albany, like, who, you know, they had an aunt or a grand aunt or somebody was here. And even if they did go to Boston or New York first, they had often been warned, like, not to stay in the big city, you know, that you could potentially get into trouble in the city and that it'd be better to go up and go out. So, you know, the vast majority stay in those metropolises. But I think if you knew someone who knew someone, it was easier to, to leave and to make mm -hmm. your way on a train, you know, or, or down from Canada. And then in relation to the Catholic Church, like I'd say it's a kind of a symbiotic relationship. I, I think the second Catholic Church in New York State was built in Albany in about 1827. Mm -hmm. And so... Actually, like I'd say the church in Hudson was built because the Irish were here mm. rather than the church was built to welcome in, you know, the immigrants. Um, we know, you know, Catherine was, I think, buried in, in the local Catholic church. Her, her services are mentioned in there. But I'm sure um, that the fact the presence of the immigrants helped to kind of expedite the building of the church rather than the church was here to welcome them in you know mm -hmm. um, but that that's probably we'd have to look at dates you know um but definitely maids giving i mean they built the old saint patrick's cathedral you know downtown basically maids remittances you know so mm -hmm. um they were a huge source of revenue for the church it's fascinating okay, yeah. kind of building on a, a couple of those points or um yeah, building on a couple of those points. Um, uh, as far as um, why some of them might have uh, been attracted to the Hudson Valley, or at mm -hmm. least kind of specific cases like Olana or like Lindenwald, there might have also been some prestige to mm -hmm. working for people who were notable names at the time. Frederick Church was one of the most famous painters in the country at, at that time in the mid 1800s. Um, Martin Van Buren, of course, former president of the US. Mm -hmm. um, so there might have been some status that just kind of came along with working in that kind of household. And mm -hmm. uh, Martin Van Buren's house staff, I think, was usually around four people at a time. Um, the church is a little bit bigger than that, usually. Mm -hmm. But um, even so, it was maybe better socially than working for just smaller middle class households mm -hmm. that might just have one servant. Mm -hmm. and, Certainly uh, less work. Thus you increase, know, one of many. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> decrease the workload and increase yeah. the uh, sort of social aspect of, yeah. of working up here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. As far as just you logistics know, of travel, uh, as far as how people from the city would come up, and this is, say, the churches when they went to New York City. Church, by the way, did keep a studio in, in Manhattan uh, right up until the end of the 1880s. So he was still periodically traveling back to New York to paint, or in later years, he tended to do more of his painting here on the property, but still used the studio in New York as kind of a business office to meet with buyers in the city. And oftentimes when he would go to New York to uh, either work or to uh, facilitate sales or gallery shows or what have you, uh, oftentimes his wife Isabel would go with him and she would actually specifically be going to hiring agents, these four staff members mm -hmm. in New York. Um, and as far as the logistics of travel, um, certainly the uh, river boats would have been a main line of travel. It was, uh, I believe, about six hours 
between mm -hmm. Hudson or Catskill and New mm -hmm. York City. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Once the railroads were established, which I know on the uh, west side of the river, passenger service was established by about the late 1840s or so. Um, I'd have to look up an exact year, but probably similar on the uh, mm -hmm. east side where we are. Um, and that would be a three or four hour trip at most by train. Um, and certainly you could also uh, go by train from the other side of the river and take a ferry across. Mm -hmm. No bridges back then, but there were ferries in. Uh, there was a Hudson Athens ferry. Um, there was a ferry connecting to Catskill. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the ferry dock at Catskill Point is still there, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, again, just kind of expanding on some of the logistics of yeah, and I just saw there was a around. question about wages, and we yeah. had um, Mary Alice Montoya, she's the park ranger down at Kinderhook, and she was talking about, and somebody mentioned it in the comments, a huge kind of turnover of staff, you know, mm -hmm. um, at Kinderhook especially, and, and these other, because they were so isolated, you know, and, but she said he paid over the odds, actually. Uh, yeah. I can't remember how much he said, but he kind of had to overpay the staff as yeah. a sort of incentive to get them to stay, so they would have been, you know, paid kind of compensation, you know, money for, yeah. for putting and up with the boredom, you know, but I, I should mention to too, um, the, the room I'm in right now, if anyone can see my uh, backdrop here, this actually is one of the servants' bedrooms. Um, mm. That's now my office. We have four staff offices that were the servants' bedrooms and uh, they're physically, there is a separation. Um, physically, there are a few steps below the main bedroom level, but they're, on the other hand, not in the attic or in the basement or mm -hmm in closets or what have you they're actually fairly decent we, we often compare them to uh, college dorm size mm. rooms and they usually did have probably two people sharing each of them um but uh again fairly decent sized rooms uh gas lighting heating um windows each one had at least uh one side worth of windows um we don't know specifically which serving staff member had my room but uh Probably not Jane McKenna. There, there actually is a, an even nicer one that uh, mm -hmm. is now our director's office, Amy's office. That, uh, and that probably would have been Jane. On one wall. And uh, we think that one probably was Jane mm -hmm. uh, in that space. Um, yeah. But yeah, the churches, they did have pretty decent overall reputations as employers. They paid relatively well. And certainly the accommodations and the accommodations being as uh, decent comparatively as they are probably was another bid to try to hang on to the uh, staff members longer than they mm -hmm. otherwise might have been willing to stay. Mm -hmm. um, incidentally, That's Michael, uh, the coachman uh, and his wife, Ellen, and their daughter, they actually had their own house on the property, which is actually just behind the main residence. Uh, today kind of connected to the visitor center. Um, I believe it originally had a hyphen roof that the modern public restrooms were stuck underneath. So uh, they're all connected now. Um, but uh, basically next to the uh, stable building of our modern visitor center was the uh, house used by Michael and uh, his wife, Ellen, mm -hmm. and that's now a gallery space. So would these and those were the kind of perks, you know, that servants told each other, like that you're not mm -hmm. in a dorm in the attic with five people, you're, you're, you're going to have your own room, that's nice. So the, that information was shared, you know. Yeah, I was going to ask, would that, would those sorts of perks and, you know, kind of benefits, would that have been common or was that something that was, you know, less, would have been, been dictated by, you know, the level of wealth and esteem and fame that the family had, you know, was that kind of. I'm sure definitely size, you know, of the house and, and wealth, as you say, like sometimes maybe a maid might sleep with a child, you know, in, in the kind of dorm uh, or nursery. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, it, it's interesting because there was um, a, an advice book for servant girls published, you know, in, I want to say like the 1830s, it was reprinted and reprinted. I, I can't remember how early it started, but it was The Nun of Ken Mayer. It's kind of a famous book. We're actually going to have an exhibition about her next year. Um, and so, you know, these would have been the things that, that Irish girls knew to look out for, like ask for your day off, you know, talk mm. about the accommodations. You know, so they weren't coming into situations, I mean, obviously some of them were, and, and particularly, I guess, the younger ones, you know, might not have known to ask, but there were resources, and certainly later on, as so many were coming in, um, you know, there was a, a, a society set up downtown, um, it's in where Mother Elizabeth, or St. Elizabeth Seton, you know, that little house down, right down on, on mm -hmm. um, the 
the Battery, we'll call it, where you get the Staten Island Ferry uh, down there. They had a, a, a collection of stuff. And that was a home for girls who were Irish immigrant girls getting off the boat, like without a job. And, and there was kind of an agency there, you know, and the Immigrant Savings Bank was another place that you could go to to kind of find jobs. Um, and, you know, if anyone watched or read Brooklyn right into the 1950s, you know, like as, as informal as that, like that the parish priest might know somebody who needed somebody, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of informality, I think, with, with the maid work which again leads maybe to the isolation and the loneliness if you're mm. not careful you know like look at somebody like mary mallon you know who becomes typhoid mary comes to new york you know stays with her aunt and uncle gets a job knows she doesn't want you know low class kind of work so she works as a cook and you know is, is an asymptomatic carrier of salmonella and, and you know and ends up maybe killing three people and certainly spreading the disease. But you know, when she was released on her own recognizance after the first kind of quarantining, she promised she would not work around food again. And she, she got a job as a laundress and the money was much less. It was very harsh on your hands because you're using, you know, lye and all of these chemicals and very hot water. And, and she went back cooking, you know, and so mm. in a maternity hospital, which wasn't great, but she didn't believe in the science. Like she did not believe that she could not be sick and carry this sickness, you know? Mm. So, I mean, she spent the rest of her life on Brother Island then, you know, and, until she died in quarantine in 1935. So there is an example of a woman who, even though she had an aunt and uncle who could kind of help her initially, and, you know, and certainly did help her to get the skills to be a cook, you know, there were two males, one of whom worked as a baker, who absolutely spread the disease as much as she did. Mm. And he, they were not brought, she was like committed against her will, you know, in, in North Brother Island. Um, these two men, the guy didn't even close his bakery, you know? Mm. And so there was something to do with a gendered stereotype of a, of a bridge at this, you know, domineering kind of, um, ignorant sort of uh, independent woman you know that that rubbed this guy soper who was the the hygiene fella you know the wrong way and, and he did not close down the italian man's bakery but she wasn't allowed to work as a cook well i was gonna just i was gonna ask a little bit about some of those stereotypes that came through you know do you think in what in the images that we looked at at the, at the very beginning there's this kind of notion of this you know the bridget being very um outspoken and kind of advocating for herself do you think that that stereotype comes from the fact that there was a support system there was like a manual advocating for asking for a day off and this network i mean how does that kind of how That's does that inform point, those actually. Yeah, sometimes I think it sort of speaks to a larger stereotype about the Irish that may actually have come from the Irish men, because you read other sources that, that say Irish women are very biddable, you know, they're very superstitious, um, but they're, they're quite obedient and they're quite, because of their Catholicism, you know, like that they're quite confined. And mm -hmm. so you're not going to have an issue with them, you know, wanting to bring guests home or, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, and so there's a, you know, an element of the, they, obviously they're coming a lot of the time from, you know, mud cabins or, or you cook on a pot over a, uh, over a fire. So they don't understand the technology involved in running a house in, in, a, in an American city. But they're very strong and they're and everyone comments, even the ones who, you know, portray them kind of badly as very willing to learn. But it was that mm -hmm. initial ignorance of how to do things that kind of gave them the, the stereotype of being a bit um, buffoonish, you know. And, but mm -hmm. I, I actually think sometimes it was the paddy, um, the stereotype of paddy that was rubbing off on the women a lot because, uh, you know, I, I think most women you know, Irish women weren't particularly involved in the suffrage movement, for instance, you know, they, they weren't, uh, there was a lot of labor leaders. So Mother Jones is the most dangerous woman in America. We have Kate Melanie up here in Troy, you know, you've got uh, all these other, um, Leonora O'Reilly and all, labor was a, a big issue for women where they were talking about factory conditions and stuff. So it might've been kind of coming from there too, but I would imagine, you know, in the home, they were quite biddable and, and you know they were often integrated into the family a little bit too mm -hmm. like that story about Catherine from Roscommon you know they did work there for years if they don't get married so mm -hmm. they you know you might like raise children and then work for him when he becomes the man of the house you know yeah but, yeah to the stereotype it, it, it is funny because and I, I think people were afraid of the priests influence over them too you know so there, mm -hmm. there's a lot going on around the women that leads to this I think image of Bridget as being something maybe unmanageable, you mm -hmm. know.
there's a misogyny, a religious prejudice, a lot happening. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot happening. <laughs> um, I mean, thinking about that, thinking about the context of, um, you know, societal stereotypes with the Irish, Dan, I wonder, you know, if you could speak to a little bit more about what was the, the fa church family's relationship with some of these servants? I mean, they're living there for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there were these benefits and perks that may have indicated or at least affected the fact that they stayed there for so long. I would love to get a kind of sneak peek behind the scenes, if you have it, of what the dynamic might have been between the McKennas and, and the churches. Yeah. Yeah. Um... And, and the McKenna's did seem to be kind of special cases here um, mm -hmm. as far as other servants of uh, both Irish extraction and otherwise. Um, there were definitely some that didn't work out over the years. And at least when he was writing letters to his friends where he talks about having to get rid of somebody, church didn't uh, mince words, uh, including <laughs> common words of the time. He, he uses the term biddy in reference to uh, some of the maids and, and things like that. Um, there's uh, kind of a, an infamous quote um, where he doesn't really kind of use, I guess, stereotypical mm -hmm. specific terms like that, but there's a, a maid who was uh, terrible in her quote, stupidity and wearing my wife's life short. Um, <laughs> and she had to be gotten rid of. There was, um, I believe it was Margaret was her name, and we don't know her last name, unfortunately, but uh, there was another who uh, apparently was taken with the churches on their grand tour to uh, Europe in the Mideast in oh, wow. the late 1860s, and apparently, according to what church writes about her, she became too used to the uh, luxury of travel, and they were uh, looking forward to getting back to New York to uh, hand her her walking papers, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Um, on the other hand, the McKenna's who worked here for so many years really did seem to become um, really beloved by the churches. Mm. Um, we have uh, letters from the children when they've grown and gone off to their own devices. Um, Freddie Church, the eldest son of the family, writing from, I believe he was in Seattle at that point, that uh, apparently the, his parents had sent him a care package that included some of uh, Jane, the cook's uh, preserved peaches and he said that uh, eating them kind of sent him mentally back to Wolata. Um, there's uh, actually a number of letters from the children where they refer to Jane and Michael specifically in kind of these form terms where they, they do seem to almost see them as kind of adjacent family members in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the most famous instance, um, this is I believe the only firmly documented occasion where the churches used the uh, sort of stage-like, uh, I don't know why I'm pointing, I'm in a different room, <laughs> uh, used this uh, sort of stage-like uh, platform at the base of their grand staircase, which everyone says looks like a stage. Um, personally, I think they probably did use it for entertaining on more than just this one occasion, but the one firmly documented occasion we do have um, involved uh, a play called The Elixir of Youth, and I've not been able to find the script for it, unfortunately, I'm still looking for that, um, as part of the scene in this apparently kind of melodramatic uh, play, um, the uh, sort of female lead character who was played by uh, Susan Hale, who was a well-known travel writer at the time, um, she has to be carried down the stairs for this scene, and they uh, chose Michael McKenna, their coachman, to have the honor of carrying her down the stairs. And uh, we actually know from the letter that um, the other servants were actually allowed to watch this performance along with the family members, albeit they were apparently kind of off to the side in the room behind a screen, but the other mm -hmm. staff members were there and present. And, and mm -hmm. again, Michael actually had a kind of a starring role. So mm -hmm. yeah, they, uh, they, they really did seem to be kind of major members of the household in the eyes mm -hmm. of the family um yeah. that's my take at least yeah and again yeah. that even here did seem to be kind of uh unusual both in this site and and broadly unusual mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's interesting well. you mention um plays I, I think that was part of the thing that helps to rehabilitate the image of the irish because you know those mm -hmm. like those pictures of bridget dressing the tomatoes the potatoes continue into the 1910s but you know, as the Irish became more than just consumers of culture and they start to create their own, there's a big shift 
And so there was a very famous vaudeville play by the Russell brothers. They were an act from Limerick and they used to dress up, you know, as, as women. So, very, you know, very masculine guys and dresses and, and they were all of the stereotypes. You know, the girls were foolish and they were, you know, in a tizzy because they were burning things. And in around, I think it was 1907, there were riots in the theater in wow. both Brooklyn and New York. People threw cabbages at them. The Hibernians organized a group to go like and, and protest the show. And, there, you know, there was letters into the newspapers that if this would go down again, they would threaten to burn down one of the theaters. Wow. And how dare they sully, you know, Irish womanhood with this. And so there's a shift then in vaudeville and Tin Pan Alley and all these songs, you know, where because now the Irish are writing the material and, and they're more kind of middle class themselves in the audience. They don't want to see themselves portrayed in that way. So the, it shifts to become a little bit more sentimental. Hmm. And, you know, the Irish Colleen and Mother McCree and all of this, you know, stuff. And so it, it, that's a very interesting, I think, part of, of the drive out of Bridget you know, into like Irish American woman, even those terms which I hate, you know, shanty Irish and lace curtain Irish. It was the woman working in American homes, like who learned American manners and middle class values and how to set a table. And then she would transmit that, you know, to the family because Paddy, you know, working in the sanitation department or with the cops and the firemen, he was still ruggedly masculine, but she was kind of a, a taming influence and an Americanizing influence you know, on the family. And those are terms I had never heard. Shanty Irish and yeah, <laughs> I've sorry, never heard that up. before. Some of the yeah. other derogatory terms I've, I've well, heard and you know, a lot of the times the Irish use them about themselves. You know, so if you were shanty Irish, you were low class. You know, and and you were maybe poor and all. And but then there was a kind of a negative connotation with lace curtain too, because you were a bit snooty and you were sort of hmm. above yourself. Hmm. So this was completely captured. There used to be a cartoon strip, Maggie and Jigs. And you know how bringing up father, so this the cartoon strip migrates onto vaudeville, and you know there are even films of these. But it was that the Irish they win the lotto, and you know Jigs had been a worker, so but he secretly pines for you know the the um, corned beef you know sandwich and the beer down in the in the bar. But Maggie mm. is trying to civilize him, and so their daughter is beautiful because she's American born, so she's lovely, <laughs> and she was born into the money kind of. But Maggie gets it wrong sometimes when she tries to be snobby. So like she sometimes is overdressed and it and it's I mean it's good humoured. It was an Irish American guy himself who wrote the the um, McManus George McManus wrote the the thing. But it's very funny how you know what the Irish view as as okay to tease themselves about mm -hmm. and and how mm -hmm. far you can go into wider society with that. And the funny thing about that comic strip, I think it's only once he mentions that they're Irish. Like Jigs is not particularly Maggie it was almost synonymous with Bridget, but he he doesn't actually make too much of the fact that they're Irish Americans. But there's so many signals there, like that you know they're Irish American and not Jewish American, for instance, or, mm. or Italian American. You know. Mm. Yeah. Speaking of that, I know in our initial conversation, I do want to be mindful of time. We have a few minutes. I know, I'm sorry. Yeah. If, if questions are there, please, um, folks who are listening, and please continue to submit them. But I do want to address. You know, we had talked a little bit about how the history of um, Irish domestic workers in this country kind of fits within the larger social schema of the late 1800s and the early um, 1900s. And you were just talking a little bit about these kind of signifiers. I'm wondering. Um, just how how the Irish American and uh, Irish immigrant experiences relate to some of the other experiences happening um, with immigrants at the time period, with people who are working in some of these similar roles. Um, you know, what can we learn from thinking a little bit more about these specific experiences? I guess would be my my question. Well, you know, I I think the interesting thing about the maids, to be honest, is that it was such a singularly Irish experience on, until a certain point. So there, there are a few African American women who are doing it, you know, post uh, the Civil War era. But actually, a lot of African American women did not want to work outside of the home, and so you know, it was too reminiscent of being a, a slave, you know, or, or a house, you know, slave. Yeah, slave so, person, um, yeah. and you sometimes see ads, you know, where they're saying they don't want Irish girls, but there, there's a lot of commentary in the papers, like by the 1880s, that the, the position of maid has been so degraded by Irish girls that you can't get a good American girl to do it. And then you notice like Swedish, Danish, you know, coming in being cooks, Italian girls did not work outside of the home, you know, maybe in a factory, um, Jewish girls the same, like maybe with their father in a factory or, you know, in, in one of those apartment kind of sweatshop type situations. Um, Italian women came in much less numbers, you know, too, than Irish. So there was a few German, you know, kind of housefrau's. Um, 
and the and Irish. So I actually think the closest parallel in one way is more modern, like it's more, mm. you know, Dominican women and women from the islands coming in to be nannies or maids, you know, in the I'm talking about the 1970s, 1980s, you know, and of course, you have issues there maybe with documentation and all of that, you know, but that seems to me to be the even nurses, actually, I shouldn't limit it to just maids, but that is the demographic that it strikes me as very similar because they often are leaving their family in, you know, wherever they're from. They're coming here to work as either maids or nurses or, you know, carers, that kind of thing, shipping the money home. You know, their children could be in the homeland, you know, um, and they, they kind of occupy this in-between status as breadwinner for the family, but the family are not here, you know. And mm -hmm. again, that on that, that single woman, doing a job for a family that may or may not fully integrate her into their own mm -hmm. life. So, I, you know, I, I kind of could be wrong in that, but that's my sense of things mm -hmm. that um, we don't see another group of women workers with the way we did the Irish until much later in the 20th century. It's interesting because thinking a little bit about, um, you know, some of the, the difficult difficulties of these of these people's lives, you know, I, I'm struck by how similar it is to yeah. when we think about um, people who might be isolated and kind of this loneliness. I mean, I yeah. think that that's something that, um, you know, we can definitely carry through and doesn't have a yeah. specific time period when you're right. When you're and like experience. the women today might have language barriers and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, you know, it's slightly more, you could say it, it nearly worse almost, you know, mm -hmm. uh, did you see well, in the questions, I shouldn't maybe single her up. I was going to say, sad, yeah, story. yeah, yeah. And I was going to say, you know, thinking a little bit about this community, we've talked about Hudson specifically and about the very lucky McKenna's who, as we talk, I just keep thinking more and more how, how, lucky they were to have each other. Um, what about Albany? I, a question came in, I think you answered Sean in the Q&A, but were there communities in Albany that attracted immigrants from particular counties based on family or other networks? Definitely, you know, I, like this is all a little bit anecdotal, but absolutely because, you know, the Irish, I, certainly they had been here as long as the Dutch, although we don't get the credit <laughs> that the Dutch get in Albany. <laughs> but um, Thomas Dongan was from Ireland, he gave them the charter. Uh, but, you know, it exploded, of course, with the canal, you know, the Erie Canal in around 1817 kind of time. So there are, you know, those in that era, there's the canal workers. And then again, you know, so because they're here and all the way up along, De it's a chain migration like you know they they come whoever they are that's first they send money home or they send a ticket home and the next one comes out to them and you know they don't always make it up to albany but they normally would because that's where your start is so somebody can get you into the railroad or or get you a job in a house or you know whatever or you can stay with them you know so um so there were those kind of informal chain migration networks that people would come over and you know then there's another explosion during the the great hunger period because they're coming down often from Canada as well as up from New York. Um, and then, you know, they're pretty well established. Like uh, Albany had a very densely populated with Irish uh, and Troy, huge factories, of course, don't forget in Troy and Cohoes, you know, so there was plenty of work like, so they, they were coming for the work. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. We have just a few moments left. I do want to um, turn my attention to the chat. There's been some great conversation happening in the chat um, and mentioned that in the eight 1870 federal census was done twice in July and December. Um, and that's so fascinating that at the Treadwell home, there had been a complete turnover of three servants in those five months. So thinking a little bit about how anomalous it maybe was for the mechanics to stay on so long, um, yeah. the high turnover rate, it reminds me of the, the great resignation we're in now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, or what happened yeah. in the particular house? Like, yeah, what, what I know. Gone, it you know? makes yeah. me curious yeah. what, what was happening. And as I recall, there was a similar turnover at the, uh, I think it was that year at the uh, Martin Van Buren house too, wow. where the entire staff was wow. completely replaced. Wow. And uh, uh, Dr. Margaret Lynch Brennan mentioned that um, Dr. Patricia West speculated that Lindenwald's Irish servants would have attended St. Mary's Church in Hudson. So Alanis probably did as well. Um, yes. Someone, Jean, also chimed in that many of the Lindenwald Irish servants attended the Catholic Church in Valacia and had to walk there. So that's not, wouldn't have been very pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we have about one minute left for questions. This has been such a wonderful and illuminating conversation. Thank you all so much make a, a quick, uh, I guess, dedication. Um, it's it's so interesting to kind of delve into what the experience of these people were like, because this is actually part of my family story. Uh, my uh, two times great grandmother, Catherine Craver, was an Irish maid at a house in its opus during this period in the 1880s. So it's, it's interesting to yeah. really kind of think about what that side of my family experienced. Wow. 
um, during this this time. Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel, for sharing it. I think when we first started talking about this, we all realized that you know we all had Irish heritage somewhere in our history, and so it felt like a very personal but also um, important conversation. So yeah. thank you for those of us who've been able to join us tonight. Yeah, and especially for these women who were invisible, you know, so to shine a light on them. Yeah, thank yes. you, everyone. Yeah, it was great, and I'm delighted thank so you. many of you chatted. <laughs> thank you. Thanks.